Today on the Perception in Action podcast, a chapter-by-chapter preview of my new book, Learning to Optimize Movement. So it's time for a call to action. Hi, this is Rob Gray from Arizona State University. I've been on a now over 25-year journey as a researcher, professor, and high-performance consultant to understand how we acquire and adapt our perceptual motor skills. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. Before we get to today's topic, I want to tell you about my new book, Learning to Optimize Movement, Harnessing the Power of the Athlete-Environment Relationship, available now on Amazon in paperback and ebook formats. This book is the follow-up to my best-selling skill acquisition book, How We Learn to Move. In it, I discuss how we can go beyond learning basic coordination to becoming an elite mover, evidence-based principles for learning and coaching optimal movement. Take your game from proficiency to mastery. Now on to the show. Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from ASU and the Perception Action Podcast, here with some exciting news. My new book is here. It is the follow-up to my best-selling book on skill acquisition, How We Learn to Move. My new book is called Learning to Optimize Movement, Harnessing the Power of the Athlete-Environment Relationship. I'll give you more information at the end, but it is available on Amazon now uh, in ebook and paperback format. So what I want to do in this video, in this presentation, is to tell you, go through overall what my goals were and go through a chapter-by-chapter kind of preview so you kind of get an idea of what's inside So my main goal in this book, if you think about how we learn to move, was understanding basic coordination. The basic coordination of skill acquisition, how we learn to move and control our body to achieve our goals, touching on basic principles like variability, constraints, uh, attractors, things like that. So what I want to do in this book is go beyond that to the next level, right? So if we think about the first thing we need to do to be skillful is generate a, a useful coordination pattern. Next, we want to optimize that coordination pattern to make it more effective, to make it more efficient, to make it work under a broader range of conditions and be adaptable, et cetera, and so on. So what that's my goal in this book. Try to understand optimization, how we can get the best out of ourselves. And in it, throughout the book, I, want, I, I wanted to provide practical coaching tips and some tools. So the tips, almost every chapter you will see ends with what are the implications for coaching section. Where I try to pull out some ideas. The tools, that's the fun, one of the final chapters of the book. So over the past year or so since I wrote my first book, I have been championing this approach and work consulting and working out with a lot of different people. And through it, I have kind of come up with, identified, you know, they're not all just mine. I've identified some tools that I find very effective or applying this method and getting you to think about it. So in the, one of the chapters, I go through and give you those tools. The second goal of this is, you know, obviously in this book, I'm taking a certain approach to skill and in it, I'm highlighting the importance of looking at the whole brain body environment system. I'm trying to make the important point that there's intelligence throughout this system. I have a lot of discussion about the intelligence in the environment. That is information, the direct information we can pick up that gives us so much useful things about that we need to control our movements. And the intelligence within your body, your ability to soft assemble, your body's ability to use tension and structure it, restructure itself. It has so much in self-organize itself, right? It has so much ability in there. It's not just following the commands of your brain to be skillful. I also want to emphasize in this book how much if you, this is a point I try to make to coaches and athletes. If you establish an appropriate information movement relationship with your environment, you're picking up the right, the appropriate information, the specifying information, you're using it for the right and the right way to control your movements, you're adapting it, you're well calibrated, then you're going to get so many things, what I call for free, right? Things that will just fall out as a kind of a bonus from maintaining this relationship. These include things like anticipation using advanced cues and offline information, stability, and so on. So I'll go through that in the book. 
Okay, let's get into a chapter by chapter blow. So the first chapter is called is the subtitle of the book, Harnessing the Power of the Athlete Environmental Relationship. In this chapter, you know, you start with um, William Mace's famous quote, ask not what's inside your head, but your, your head is inside of. This is basically a discussion of the ideas of direct perception, um, understanding, trying to convince you about the, all this wonderful information out there um, and kind of the intelligence within your body, as I mentioned, its ability to self-organize and soft, soft assemble. In the second chapter, I really dig into information, right? And I use the analogy of the matrix, right? I use the analogy that I think in many of the sports we coach and things we do, we've created this matrix. The idea that everything is so complicated and ambiguous and un not very understandable in our environment, and we need to interpret it and process it and uh, figure out what it is. When in fact, there's tons of direct information just waiting there, right? So in this chapter, I'm going to go through a variety of different information sources relative to sports. For example, in as shown in this picture, I'm going to talk about for David Lee's idea of coupling tows, right? We'll talk about optic flow, all these kind of things. So I'm really do, trying to do a deep dive into understanding what information is, what specification is, and those ideas. And kind of getting you to think about as a coach, how can I understand what the information sources my athlete is using? In the third chapter, so the first three chapters, I kind of loosely uh, group them as perceiving, right? So I'm talking about pulling in information. The second, the third chapter, I'm going to talk about eye movements, right? Talk about optimizing the control of gaze. What do we know about where elite athletes look, right? What are the different strategies? There's more than one, right? And what can we do about that? How can we design practice to get athletes to look? I'm going to convince you it's very important you're looking in the right place. How can we get our athletes to look in a different place through training? Number four, I'll talk, chapter four, I'll talk about attention. <clears throat> and th this is, I'll really dive into, of course, the internal versus external attention research and use of analogies, things like that, talking a lot about my research, what I've done over the years, why does internal tension tend to hurt performance? And in this, I'm going to give my two cents on the practical use of internal versus external cues. And as a foreshadow, I do not believe that you should never use internal cues. I'm going to give you kind of my practical advice from both the research side and applying this on when and how you should use the different types of cues in, in, in instructing your athlete. So that's the first one. The next two chapters, I want to focus on the movement side of the coin, right? I'm breaking them apart in terms of the description. Obviously, we don't break them apart. They're coupled, right? So number five, I'm going to talk about perspective control. This alternative, wonderful way that we can control our movement without having to predict. So can we could make something happen in the future, like catching a Frisbee, without predicting where the Frisbee is going to be and when, right? And the answer is yes, we can, with this wonderful tool called perspective control. So I really want to dive into this and under, get you to try to understand what exactly does this mean? I know it's a bit of a tricky concept. So we're going to dive in this. I'll give you some examples of it. For example, shown in here, how do we run to catch a Frisbee? Um, we'll talk about dogs catching Frisbees for uh, those uh, pet lovers. Um, some interesting research on that. Um, and, we'll and we'll get into, uh, obviously, as I said, in every chapter, we'll end, how can we get our athletes to do this? Um, number six, we'll look at uh, more at affordances. And I'm going to call this affordance-based coaching. And what I'm trying to pitch here in this idea, this is, in this chapter, we'll talk about the difference between what I, you know, I define a capacity versus a skill. But I will talk that, well, my main goal in this, this chapter is to get you to tr convince you that the way, the really effective way to coach is to get your practice environment to do the talking for you, right? We'll talk about this example of a door handle, right? Uh, the affordance offered by a handle sticking out from a door is pulling. A push sign is an explicit instruction. A lot often what we do in practice is we tell athletes what to do verbally. When if we design it right, we think about affordances, opportunities for action, right? We make some of the uh, opportunities for action more uh, amplified or salient, right? That's what I mean by pink envelopes. This title is called pink envelopes, not push sign. I mean, amplifying affordances, making them some more attractive and stick out from the other ones for our athletes. That's what I, we, I want to try to convince you is the one of the most effective ways to coach. And again, I'll talk about how exactly we can do this. 
Chapter seven, I'm going to get into the topics of muscle tension, muscle slack, and biotensegrity, right? Again, another very, very tricky concept. I'm going to try to convince you what happens before you move is as important as what happens while you're moving, right? This is one of Franz Bosch's ideas, for example, of muscle slack, removing slack and getting the appropriate tension, which is a Bernstein also talked a lot about. And then maintaining the structure of your body through this wonderful principle of biotensegrity, how you can create internal forces to balance and re respond to perturbations like in basketball, stepping on someone else's foot, so your ankle rolls. How can we make an athlete better able to respond to those, right? So we're going to talk about that. <laughs> Chapter eight, I want to talk about something we often overlook when talking about scale acquisition is the issues of efficiency in the economy, right? How can we have an effective movement solution that also does not use as much energy, right? So we don't get fatigued that quick, quickly, have more energy in the fourth quarter at the end of the game, right? So in the ninth inning, whatever sport we're talking about. So I want to talk about some research on movement efficiency and economy, how we can measure it using some tools and how we can get our athletes to become more efficient movement, right? Instead of having, you know, quote unquote, a lot of moving parts, how can we move efficiency? And I'm going to try to convince you that this is actually a very important constraint that your body puts on self-organization. So, so though that's kind of those three is the movement. The next set of chapters I've called adapting, right? Because going beyond just information and movement, how can we make our movement our solutions more adaptable to different environments so they work under different constraints and so on? And in chapter nine, I'm going to talk about skilled intentionality which is the idea of keeping a lot of options open, right? Keeping a lot of available affordances open, right? So, you know, I often use the example of a two-on-one in sports like hockey or basketball, right? What we want to do as an athlete is move, not just to achieve our goal, but to keep as many options, shooting, passing, driving to the goal, deking around the defender, keep it open as long as possible, Right. We're actually, you know, and I introduced the idea of deciding slow, right? We think about fast decision making as being good. It's not always, right? So I want to talk about this idea of keeping these options open, keeping the affordances open, and how we can train our athletes to, to be able to do that, which is I think as important as as moving itself, right? As uh, to achieve a specific goal. Chapter 10 will dive into the other side of the coin, right? So if it's skilled intentionality is keeping, if you think about it invitations for action. So I tend to, I mean, the book, I'm going to use this analogy of envelopes, right? So um, if you move, have skilled intentionality, you're keeping, all, you're getting a lot of envelopes delivered to you. A lot of invitations. Think about being asked out to the prom, right? A lot of invitations. That metastability is the other side of the coin. It's having a lot of letter openers, right? So it's having a lot of different ways to achieve the same goal, accept the same affordance. Right. And, and so instead of having just one way to catch a ball or one type of punch to use in a fight, right, metastability is moving so does to keep lots of different ways to achieve the same goal, a punch, a jab, an uppercut, you know, and so on. So that's the idea. We'll talk about metastability, what it is, uh, you know, and the idea of exploiting motor abundance, well, having lots of different solu movement solutions. In chapter 11, I'll go into the topic of team coordination, right, getting into the idea that this is achieved through shared affordances, having your athlete pick up the same invitations from the environment at the same time, right? And how we can achieve this through practice design, talking about some research. Um, the 12, Chapter 12, I'm going to get into this kind of sticky issue for the ecological approach is using what's called offline information, right? So instead of using information that's directly available in the moment, like tau and optic flow and all these wonderful things, how can I use information from the event history, right? So if a pitcher throws me three fastballs in a row, the team I'm playing against in football has three running plays in a row. Right? Obviously, that's useful information that we want to incorporate into our movement solution, not just have to rely on the in-the-moment things. And we can do that right, very easily um, without having to resort to thinking about prediction and mental models. And I'll also talk about a very, very different view of what we're doing with the advanced cues we get from our opponent. That is, you know, their body language as they're throwing or serving a ball. So I'll talk about very different views on how we how we can think about these things and how we can coach them. 
The last few chapters I'm talking about um, strength. I call it strengthening, right? So we have these good information control laws. We've adapted them to different environments by keeping multiple options open, having multiple solutions, using offline information like event history. Now we want them to make them strong against things that are going to try to break apart this relationship. The first one I'm going to talk about is pressure and emotion, right? What causes choking under pressure? Um, what are some of the effective ways? I, I present a lot of ideas for how you can add pressure to your practice, how you can make your pressure, your practices hot. By that I mean having an emotional component to them instead of cold, right? So I present a lot of practical information based on the research of how you can do this, which I think is a really, really valuable thing to do. Chapter 14, we'll talk about how an athlete deals with dif the difficulty of a task, right? Task difficulty. And the really critical question I get from a lot of coaches, how difficult should practice be, right? We'll talk about this really kind of fairly simple way to do address this, the 70% rule. And then we'll dive into more of the, the, the details of it, looking at the challenge point, point hypothesis and this trade-off between performance in the moment and learning in the long run. Right, we'll talk about those things. So, how can we sign the challenge, the, the challenge level in practice, so we're not breaking our athlete apart by getting them demotivated and feel like they're a failure? But at the same time, we're challenging them enough so they fail sometimes and learn. Chapter fifteen, I'm going to talk about pain and injury. Right, how should we be dealing with athletes' injury? I'm going to revisit the idea I had in how we learn to move that we need to think of in terms of adaptation, not rehabilitation going back. I'll talk about some newer research and some new ideas, talk about some different, like the Feldenkrais method um, for tr training movement as opposed to traditional physical therapy. I'll talk about really the challenging thing of pain as a constraint. What does pain do to an athlete's, the way they self-organize and how can we deal with that? And then I'll introduce, you know, this fascinating concept of anti-fragility, the idea that, not only can we be resilient to injury, you know, just recover from these stressors we have in our environment, but that can actually make us stronger in the long run, right? They can make our skill even more powerful and strong and stable. And as I said in the start, the last chapter are some of the tools that I view, I like to use to support practice design, you know, tools for designing constraints, designing cues for tracking variability to assessing how representative your practice is. So I'm going to put all these out there and share them with you. As I said, these are ones I like and I've also from feedback from talking about with a lot of different coaches that they find useful. So that's it. That's the, the new book. Um, I hope you, if you pick it up, you enjoy it. Um, as I said, it's called Learning to Optimize Movement, Harnessing the Power of the Athlete-Environment Relationship. As It's available on Amazon right now if you go and look um, in either ebook or paperback format. Um, I'm working on the audiobook version, so probably in a month or so, it will be up as well. Or you can go to perceptionaction.com forward slash book, and you will find information about this book and my, my, other, my other one before it, How We Learn to Move. So thanks for listening. Cheers for now, and keep them coupled. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at shakyweights. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including a monthly coaching meetup, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perceptionaction. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled. Hey.